Today, I will speak about corruption. Corruption can be defined as the abuse of power for personal gain. Usually there are two forms of corruption. There's petty corruption, which is easily perceived by the public through their interactions with public officials. And then there's elite corruption. More specifically, high-level political corruption, where public officials make decisions behind closed doors in order to benefit themselves. All of this creates a veil of secrecy. Corruption costs. Public budgets are exhausted through reckless decisions that are made by public officials. And it's the very citizens who are the ones who have to pay for these corrupt activities, be it through increased taxes or the introduction of new taxes. Corruption doesn't only cost in terms of money. Corruption costs in terms of the public's trust in the very institutions that we have, the democratic institutions. Corruption also costs in the willingness of citizens to participate within their societies. Antisocial behavior increases. Criminality increases. All of this is because of corruption. Recently, there was an international anti-corruption conference in which a speaker made a lecture. The lecture was based on the ethical anti-corruption framework, Lessons for the Caribbean. Now I sat there and I ponder upon this lecture and I had to think about what are the necessary reforms that are needed in order for us to not only fight corruption, but in order to aid in the development of our country. First, we must have an anti-corruption agency where we can report corrupt acts to an independent body who then, who then investigates these allegations of corruption. Secondly, public finance disclosure. This is a very pressing issue. The very same individuals who we entrust in leadership positions, be it members of parliament, senators, or senior government officials, they are obliged by law to disclose their assets and liabilities. We cannot have politicians coming in and making 24, well not 24,000, but 40 to 50 thousand dollars a year and then become millionaires after five year period. Third, thirdly, we must have political campaign finance laws. We must know who is exactly contributing to our political parties when time comes to election. We must have a cap on the spending by both nationals and, in extreme case, foreigners who are contributing to these political parties, pushing their own political agenda at the cost of our democracy. Third, I mean, actually fourth point. Public procurement. Public procurement is the way that the government issues tenders. And quite frankly, in many countries, it's, a, it's a carried out through an opaque process. The citizens don't know how their money is being spent. You know, public officials, they issue these contracts to whomever are politically aligned to them. The government, in turn, in most instances, does not actually get value for their dollar. This is a waste, and it's a deterrent to our actual national development. The fifth point is whistleblower protection. 
we have civil servants all around the world. In many countries, they see corrupt acts occurring within their government departments, government bodies. But they are too afraid to speak out. Victimization. They are too afraid to lose their jobs. There needs to be independent bodies where public servants can anonymously submit a report of any corrupt activities that they see, and this report will be evaluated by this independent body. This needs to happen. And the sixth point, the most fundamental point, is a fundamental human right, freedom of information. With freedom of information, the public is aware of how the government is performing, how the government spends the public our money, and how they make decisions. Therefore, the public is allowed to participate in the decision-making process. Now, there are many countries around the world. Actually, there's almost 100 countries now that have a Freedom of Information Act enforced. And the legal analysis of these Freedom of Information Acts are available online for anyone to read up on. So there's never an excuse to delay an enforcement of a Freedom of Information Act. It is there. But moreover, there's no need for foreign consultants to consult on how to draft the appropriate <laughs> Freedom of Information Act. <laughs> it is there and it is available for the public. Now, in pre preparing for this talk, I decided to conduct a little experiment. I took two countries. I'm very inquisitive, so I wanted to find out. I took one country that has an enforced Freedom of Information Act, and another country that does not have an enforced Freedom of Information Act. In the first country, I sent a letter to the government of that country. And I asked them, question number one, who are the MPs that receive a housing allowances on a monthly basis? Question number two, with that list of MPs who receive a housing allowance on a monthly basis, please provide me with the amount that was received during the period of January to May 2014. Now in this country, the Freedom of Information Act, it states that for a viable request for information, the government agency must respond within 10 days. So my questions were answered on the ninth day. I received an official document from that government and it detailed the exact responses to the questions I had asked. And I said, okay, this is how the act works. Let me take another country where there's no freedom of information laws. Now in this country, there was a government department that decided to move their offices from a national insurance building into a private complex. <laughs> I wanted to find out. I have three questions for this, this country. The, the first question was, why was this decision made to relocate this government office into a private complex? The second question was, how long was the duration of the lease signed for for that private entity? And the third question was, how much is paid on a monthly basis in rent to that private entity? So, as I said, this country has no freedom of information laws. So after numerous attempts, phone call, long distance phone calls made, emails made, I received a response in 17 days from a senior official within that department. The senior officials response was, 
to continue to provide timely and compassionate services for our clients and to provide our workers with better working conditions, the decision was made to relocate the office. Hmm. Now, the operative word in that response is to continue. So if you were already providing timely and compassionate services, why do I need to relocate? <laughs> So my two remaining my two remaining questions they remain unanswered actually. The, the ones that refer to how much was paid and the duration of the of the lease. I will continue to press for those answers. There's a sense of administrative silence where we cannot receive the answers to very simple questions we ask from our own representatives. And we now know the anti-corruption reforms that need to be initiated and enforced. Now there needs to be an active civil society that would engage in pushing their government in order to release certain information. And all of this is for our national development. Now, here's an idea. How about we create a website where any citizen can make their request for information to any public body. And within that website, there's a website team that will relay that information to the responsible public body. And the responses that are received, both answered or unanswered, will be updated to the website. So you can see what requests for information I've made and the responses that I've received or not. Likewise, I can do the same for you. Therefore, we create a transparent and verifiable archive in which if the responses to our answers continue to go unanswered, the evidence is built. And so perhaps will the impetus for social change. I will continue to learn more about anti-corruption reforms and innovative tools. We need to work together in order to push our government to open up because the lack of transparency is an affront to our democracy. Thank you.